following program brought to you in part by Hemp Shield and Can I Help You? Dot care. My name is Danielle Rodellison. I own and operate Trailblazing Productions, which is a licensed cannabis farm up in Bellingham. We cultivate pesticide free, DOH compliant, medical grade cannabis. Uh, I am also the president of the Cannabis Alliance, which is a nonprofit dedicated to the advancement of a vital, ethical, and sustainable cannabis industry. Uh, we are not just a business trade association. Our members are cultivators and processors, as well as labs, ancillary, patients, veterans, and consumers. Because we believe in an effort to create good policy that a cannabis industry can stand for 5, 10, 30, 50 years into the future, we have to take everybody's different perspectives so that we can make those, that, and that 30,000 level view to make those, those rules and regulations. And that's all I'm going to talk about, about myself. You guys are here for the HempFest panel, Genetics for Generations, the Best Practices and How to Preserve uh, Genetics. And I am really honored to be up here with such an amazing group of people. Um, Beth, why don't you start us off, take three to five minutes and tell us about how awesome you are. Hi, I'm Beth and I'm the most awesomest. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, uh, my name is Beth Schechter and I run an organization called the Open Cannabis Project. We are um, a nonprofit whose main mission is to document as many cannabis and hemp varieties as possible for the primary purpose of um, keeping overbroad patents off of cannabis. Um, we've seen a few go through actually recently in Canada, which is a, a bit of a bummer. Um, and so we're working to basically collect as much information as we can to prevent that happening in the future. And in doing so, we are creating a large open data set of cannabis data that can be used, can, that can be used by scientists, by researchers, by anybody who's really interested in studying the plant. And I'm really excited um, to build this out and get it out there because, as we know, there are so many. Uh, there's a there's a bit of a, a nomenclature issue going on with cannabis, where you know, like one thing of Blue Dream might not be genetically related to something else. It's called Blue Dream. Well, what would be great would be able to have a bunch of data from a lot of different Blue Dreams, so that you all can see the differences between all of them and start making better choices as patients and consumers. Um, so yeah, I'm Beth Schechter, and that's what I do. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel John. I go by DJ for short, or DJ Short. Uh, I'm breeding, been breeding cannabis for a long time now. Um, basically, my um, method that I use the most is just objective and subjective analysis of finished product, primarily on myself and, and other various people to determine which are the most desirable strains. Um, and that's basically my mode of operation for doing that. Um, bunches of other things, but that, that's the uh, basics of it. Now, I very much am into um, finding some way of making these things public domain uh, to keep them out of uh, anybody's hands that can claim ownership. Um, and we have a little bit of an uphill struggle on that, but um, do what we can. Hi, I'm Kevin Jodry. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm a owner of Wonderland Nursery. I've uh, been involved in cannabis probably 40, I think I just turned 52, so 41 years now. And a lot of my desire now at this stage in my uh, life and career is really to keep uh, moving genetics into the hands of the people. I believe that fundamentally the cannabis varietals were preserved by the cultivators themselves. And so you had this chemovar cultivar intersection where the plant would work for the purposes needed and the quality of the product was uh, desirable and suitable for the individuals who used it. And to me, so much of it right now is, uh, is um, a, a chase and a race for who can control the material. And so for me, I think I have one of the largest populations of plants that are mapped genetically, which then makes it more of an open source situation so that people have some situation that allows them to use these things and someone can't come along and say, hey, we've already stamped and marked this prior. And, and I've done that with uh, CBD cultivars where I released ACDC into the system. So that was the first time CBD material was released at a wholesale level and I gave away 150,000 clones for free to the public so that that varietal is global. And that's still the basic desire of what I seek now is to allow individuals to be able to have their own cannabis varieties, the own things that they use so that you're not dependent on mainstream production methodologies. I have so many questions, but I'm gonna try and just kind of slow down here. So um, when we started Trailblaze in, in Washington State, we were given 15 days to source our genetics. And we've always stand, stayed 
by the um, stands that we got them from the Tooth Fairy and from Santa Claus. Uh, we were lucky enough, honestly, that we have come from a long line of growers and knew where to get genetics. But if you weren't as lucky as we were, how do people source genetics and what are they looking for when they do that? Um, fundamentally, you're, you're sourcing genetics for your need. And so if one has a desired outcome, then what you would have to do is you'd have to look for people who are in similar situations as you who utilize things of that nature. There is no large company you're gonna to go to that has a base of everything you want and desire because what they work off of is trends. And for people that are breeders, like so I say, Dan, it's got a history of breeding a lot of the similar cultivars where I mean the genetic material's been the same. Because in those gene pools that he selected, he finds qualities that allow them to steer a direction. And so you want to find people who are working in similar situations to yourself so that you can start to get material that's kind of been proven to work. And then once you get into that material, now you can start to breed into it yourself to kind of fine tune what you're seeking and what you desire. And I think that most people believe it's this instantaneous, I run to the store, I buy what I need right now and I'm in. And it's not, it's really a lifetime pursuit of chasing it. And people try to chase trends, I think, too quickly. They try to go for a strain du jour, what's hot today, I want to be what's hot today. And the bottom line is you have to take a look at what's hot for time. And, and, and the truth of it is that a good cannabis from 1970 is still good cannabis in 2018. Beware the hype. There's, there's a lot of hype going on right now and that lends to this popularity. As far as acquiring genetics, I mean, they're out there, but we're all dealing with this same wretched legal gray area. My hope and dream is someday that this will all be treated the same way as tomatoes, right? Now, my analogy for tomatoes is, uh, let's say for example, I were utilizing um, available genetics and, and played around with them and I came up with a tomato that were small, blue, sweet, and tasted like blueberries. What would the law be regarding those seeds? I mean, I can lease them out to Burpee or Cargill or whomever, um, but the, uh, the, there is already an established protocol in terms of how to deal with these things genetically and, and let's just do what we do with tomatoes for cannabis. You talked about open source. What is open source for those of us that might not know? Um, and how could it be used to preserve the, the richness of genetic diversity? Um, that's a great question. So open source, as far as I know, really has its, um, its uh, uh, origins is the word, not the word I'm looking for, but it has its, um, it originated in software. And the idea being that, you know, we needed a framework that would allow for people to make something, still have maybe authorship over that thing, but then put it out into the world so that other people could use it. And, you know, the reason why this is really important in something like software is because, you know, think about something like a JPEG image or a function that like, oh, I click a button, boop, and then a window pops up, right? Those are all functions that all of us want to be able to use when we're coding and we're making software. Um, and maybe there's something really fancy that someone made, but we really want to get that out there so that everybody can use it and continue to innovate and work, you know, build on each other's worth, work rather than keeping it all secret. Um, so that's kind of what open source is in software. Um, within and within that, you know, there are ideas around like how to share something like data. So. Um, I come from, uh, I am not a, a geneticist or a breeder, I come from the open data world. So that's really more of where my background is. And for many years I worked closely with a bunch of people who work in open source map making, which is really cool um, in a very nerdy kind of way. And you know, for people who are making map data specifically for um, some, there's, so there's an application called OpenStreetMap and OpenStreetMap is great. What's great about OpenStreetMap is that you know anybody can go and make data um, about their area and then you can give that data away and then other people can use that to make maps, which is actually really cool. Um, if you ever try to make a, like a custom map with Google Maps, then you know just how on lockdown their data is. So having this big open like Wikipedia of map data is actually really cool. Um, under their open source license, um, if you are making a new map with data from OpenStreetMap, then you have to give the um, you have to give the author of that data attribution. Um, so you have to say like this was created by OpenStreetMap contributors. Um, they it's a, a part of the license has to do with share alike. So the idea is that like you can share that data out into the world, but like 
please don't take that data and then use it to build something proprietary. Like that's not the way that we use open source. And so we can start to think about ways how this might be applied to something like breeding and genetics, right? Rather than having um, an author of something like software, you have an author in, in the shape of like a breeder. Um, you know, some of the rules kind of break down a little bit because open source with software really applies to um, copyright law and um, not to get too nerdy too fast on all of you, but you know, there's some distinctions between how copyright wor works and, and assumed authorship uh, based on your original work versus something like plants, which actually, which falls under patent law. Um, by the way, my lawyers always tell me to tell to remind everyone that I'm not a lawyer, even though I talk about law a lot. Like this is, I'm not giving you legal advice right now, but I am talking about law. Um, so uh, the, so you know, plants actually fall under patents. Patents have a whole different set of rules. Um, they become particularly complicated rules for cannabis because we exist in this um, wonky gray area. So, but actually right now, um, um, along with Strainly and then hopefully maybe with these guys right here, uh, Open Cannabis Project is working on an open source license for cannabis that people could potentially use um, to actually, like in lieu of say a commercial license. Um, there are some, some of the places where things get a little bit wonky is that, you know, typically when you say register your amazing blue, sweet, tiny tomato, you can take your seeds to a seed bank and then all of your genetics are registered there and, you know, there's just like this very tightly knit trail between this unique piece of genetic material and then all of the documentation and the licensing goes with that. Because of our legal gray area, we kind of have to figure out a way to dance around that and that is up for um, debate and ideas from the community. Clones, seeds, tissue culture, what are they? What are the differences? And uh, what are the pros and cons of each method? Is there one method or another that is better at preserving genetics that I did, me me that I did not mention? Um, well, everything derived from seed at some point and seed is a beautiful way to hold a diversity. And so typically when you hold a single plant, you're holding a cultivar, you're holding a cultivated variety, something selected for specific traits, be it a chemovar or cultivar, meaning it has resistance and grow, aggressive vigor, or the chemovar is it has specific terpene profiles or unique cannabinoid profiles. So when you're talking about a specific plant that's been sifted, that's hyper-valuable, but you have to hold a genetic pool around it or you don't have the ability to adjust to circumstances that you're gonna see in the future, typically pathogenic issues, viral problems. Um, so to me, you hold plants in plant form so that you hold these unique cultivars. You breed into them to hold them in seed form so you have a more broad-based genetic package to pull from in the future. And then the beauty of micropropagation, which I'm involved in, is that what you can do is you can go in and you can start to scrub viral contamination out of a lot of the plants we have and you have a lot of viral contamination now so when i'm taking them to the lab and i'm going through them we're looking at maybe 40 percent of the cultivars i play with have some kind of virus and the irony is that a lot of the viruses don't really come out in terms of reduced production potential only some of them do some of them are just latent they're there but if you get rid of all of them what you have is you have a pathogenically free material so that that way what you have is the greatest chance for survivability of a cultivar. And so I think that when you're talking about preservation, you preserve it in, in, in form of a living material and biological organic base. And then you have something in a cryo, which is basically in stasis. And then you hold it in micropropagation form, which is in culture. So what you have is you have multiple redundancies. And then ideally you would spread that out to a variety of people. Because if you've ever lost something, you realize that it's priceless, you can't recover it. So you have to have multiple forms of holding the material and multiple people holding the material if you really want to have a true long-term holdability. Otherwise, it's a very short-term situation you're looking at, and all you have to have is a bump somewhere, and all of a sudden you lose the material, and now you're not in that genomic form. And with the fact that the, the populations have been so truncated globally because of the shifts in opiate and uh, coca production, so cannabis, which was dominant, is no longer. And so you can't go mine back into the old materials. And so what you're left with is, is very limited pools of very polyhybrid varietals, meaning that it's very difficult to get back to something stable in breeding. So to me, you hold it in multiple forms, cultivar, seed, in micro, and then you make sure you have multiple people hold it. And uh, regarding tissue culture, I mean, theoretically, it sounds beautiful. Um, well, the, the information I've been picking up is that some of the polyhybridized uh, strains are difficult to uh, uh, 
collect in that. They're, they're tough to get the uh, the formulation, so it might take you six months to dial in a formula to actually get it to strike correctly and build. And so a lot of the people that are coming into it are using data from other micropropagation projects, but cannabis has to be done selectively. So far, I think I have about 15 different production cultivars in culture that are actually workable. And then on some of them, we just pull them out of rotation until they, the lab can figure out how to stabilize the formulations, meaning the hormonal loads. What, what percentage was your success, I'm curious, in terms of uh, tissue culture? Oh, the, right now, good, because we've, we have some data because the, the head scientist for the lab that's part of my team has a history of doing cannabis culture. So I've been doing microprop on cannabis probably nine to 10 years now with the university and with private people. So we can start to figure out what's the reality of strike rate and we went through, I remember when I first did it, we went through 40 different varieties. We could only get one to root outright, and that was a white Russian cut. And the, it, it showed me the potential of propagation in that media. But 39 of the other cuttings we could not get to work because it was going to take us six months to a year, perhaps, to figure out the individual formulations required to give you the actual stability needed to make it profitable, for one. Because if it doesn't work financially, no one can afford to bleed. And then, does it actually work? So in Washington State, we were given 15 days where we had this open, you could bring in any genetics from anywhere. And now that, that uh, timetable is closed, right? So theoretically, you're not supposed to bring in anything. Uh, there's no more Santa Claus or Tooth Fairy in this, in this instance. How does a place like Washington and the 502 industry bring, like, preserve their genetics? Well, fundamentally, they didn't DNA anything. So they just said, tell me what you brought in, and then you're going to call it that. And so what you really end up doing is you start to bring in new genomic forms through the back door, just like you did through the first 15 days. And you say, this is this, and we just, who cares about the name? The names are irrelevant. It's really, what is it on a genomic level? What is it related to? So that you understand how not to bottleneck the breed. And then what are you working with and what your needs are? And so because there is no true, you can only do this, it's more of a matter of they made it difficult. And I, I mean, I, I provided genetics into Washington just so that people would have certain forms and material to work with in population base. So, you know, I remember when this happened. But nobody has any idea what they're looking at. You could bring a bag of hemp seed in for all Christ's sakes and no one would know. And from there you can say you're popping up all kinds of new material and it's, it's, it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's a very uh, unusual system to say this is the only gene pool you're allowed to mess with for the rest of your existence. And so because it's, it's such a, a punitive, uh, unintelligent approach to agriculture, you have to basically skirt some of these things intelligently so that you're able to really keep developing new lines and new stabilities. But man, you know, it, it's tough. When you're working in legal cannabis, you are held pretty tight to anything intelligent. And I think another uh, side of this is to very seriously question the authority of the people who are putting these regulations upon us. Why 15 days? Who, who came up with that and why? All right. And what other industry is held to that standard? None. All right. So let's hope for some change coming up here in the future. Yeah, my thought is um, welcome to Prohibition 2.0. Um, and I'm new to the cannabis game and I see this very quickly. Um, but I do have a bit of a dream about this actually, and I don't know if it's something that would work, but it would be really awesome. Like, I would love for Open Cannabis Project, which we are really a data collector, we don't handle any plants. Um, and I thought a lot about this problem that we've talked about with like seed registration or having something like that. And I think it would be really, I think one way that we could try to start solving this problem would be to have it like state by state seed banks of open source seeds where we have a program where we genetically test everything that comes in we preserve it in-house we also give like a certification back to the breeder or whoever you know actually owns those seeds and so you have both a centralized repository of verified strains or cultivars whatever and then you also have the and then, and then it's also distributed among people as well in a really verified way um, because we all know that you know there's a lot of risk that come like we have this challenge, right, where we need to have some sort of way to verify all this stuff. 
Um, there's a lot, we're not really incentivized to keep a bunch of genetics all in the same place because God forbid the feds come in and take all that away. That's really sad and scary. So we have to figure out systems that sort of work with that while also providing verifiability. But I think, you know, a state by state system is something that could potentially work until we get rid of the drug schedule. Well, it makes total sense too, because those are all different, uh, uh, growing conditions and situations and desirability and so fundamentally stuff that's in California works in California but it doesn't mean it's going to work in Nebraska mm -hmm. and what you end up doing is you shoehorn products into markets because you believe they're sexy and trendy and they, they're not meant to ever be grown in that particular market so what you're doing is you're doing stuff that you don't do in commercial agriculture so everything that we do in cannabis is the polar opposite of sustainable forms of ag and, and none of it makes sense. And so what we're trying to do, a lot of us, is to figure out, you know, how do you stamp products so that this way people can't come in and say, I invented that and now you owe me money. And then how do you distribute through the masses the genetic material? That's why I've been giving away plants so heavy for so many decades. And people thought I lost my mind when I did it originally, but you can't keep products safely in a regulated situation where you don't have any form of safety. And once you lose the material, it's gone forever. You're not gonna get it back. And so it's the idea of how do we create banks and states and how do you create banks and regions? And, and then who is the banker of that? Basically, I call myself a librarian because I'm, I'm holding the genetic books for the future. What are some common mistakes that you see cultivators do regarding cannabis genetics and how can they avoid them? Yeah, um, <laughs> try not to fall in love with the plant while it's growing. The main way I judge my herb is by the effect of the finished product. Everything else is secondary, how it looks, smells, tastes, all those things. It has to pass the muster of making me feel well. Um, that, that's the, the, the basic for me. I think people get too, too caught up in multitudes of varietals that if you go back historically into regions, families would have bred a line. They wouldn't have bred 400 lines. They would, they would have bred a line. And in that line, there would have been adaptability that would have allowed each season to make fruition. Meaning that this was a year it was hotter than normal, some plants made it. This is the year it was wetter than normal, some plants made it. But they worked a line and within that line, they chose what they uh, per perceived as the most resistant, best quality. And also on the, like, like Dan's saying, the best quality theorily, me mentally. And, and then spiritually, physically, all these qualities that we use cannabis for. And you work a line, and if you can preserve a line, then you've done something that really no one has because there's really very few inbred lines in cannabis today. And so the idea that you're gonna have 300 different things you're holding and you're gonna develop 300 different things, there's no way to get the population base up to the level you need to have really the diversity. And I would say if people wanted to really work on preservation, what you do is you choose something that really works for you in, in your desire for yourself because then it's easy to be able to justify why you're doing it. But if you're breeding for trends, by the time you get the plant bred out, you've already missed the trend. And what you end up having is now you chase a new trend and you chase a new trend, but you never really work a line completely to where it has consistent results in the progeny. So when you're breeding it, you can expect something to come out of it that you expected to have happened. Most people are rolling the damn dice. I tell people that your dog jumped over my fence and produced puppies with my dog. That doesn't make you a dog breeder. And that's the same with cannabis. You have to really be directed on what you want. And the more you spread yourself out and diffuse yourself, the harder it is to do that. And so I think for most people, to work a very specific line for their application and desire allows you to have the most diversity because then I get to utilize your genetic material, you use my genetic material, and we get to have a, a true sharing of material that was once normal. And you know now it's uh, very much not so. So Beth, so talk like as a as a cannabis farmer, how do we use open source to preserve our genetics? Like how does this work? What is the process? And then to the rest of the panel, are there other resources out there that you guys are aware of that can help people preserve their genetics? Sure. So, um, so Open Cannabis Project right now is building a tool that will allow people to anonymously create public domain declarations with using your lab data. So you'd be able to take um, reports for a specific plant and put it online um, to have one way. And that's one way that you can actually like open source really more your data more so than your genetics, right? Because we can't, like I said, we don't yet have a way to sort of like preserve the genetics themselves. That's going to be up to um, the cultivator. But one thing that you can do 
right now as a way to help keep patents off while we were building this tool like one thing that you can do to help um, put your information into the public domain which is a way to help keep patents off of your plants which is a big problem um, is to post your lab results publicly if you have a website for your farm or your facility like put that information up there the whole point is to get information out into the public which is scary to do but it's a thing that you have to do um, in order to keep other people from saying hey I invented your th I invented a, a strain that's just like that one uh, just so you know, um, seeds left undisturbed in the fridge are good for 10 to 20 years. And, and like I said earlier, share them and diffuse it across as wide an area as possible. Get your genetic material. If you're into working on genetic lines, get as much of it into the hands of as many people possibly. And what it does is it allows this to become something that's in the human population. And what you'll have is you'll have a higher level of survivability. A lot of the cultivars I've messed with over the years, if I hadn't given them away, then I wouldn't be able to get them back. And a lot of it is uh, you share with people, but what you find is when things have high value, it's very hard to get them back. But it's amazing how regular people, people who just love cannabis, are so much more often desirous to return the cultivar to you when you need it than someone who is is in a business project and, and, and believes that that single cutting is the future of their entire world. And so when you spread the material around, you're, you're not diminishing you. If your whole world is based off a single cut and that's all you have to work with, at some point you're gonna become obsolete too. So you gotta realize that the cutting is part of the overall package. It's you, it's your place of cultivation, it's, it's the, what your desire is in general. And so to me, you know, sharing the material is the only way that I really believe you can do it. I don't think anybody can hold it. If you look at the seed bank in, was it, um, Antarctica, my favorite picture of it was them running out of the seed bank with empty uh, flats that they hold six packs in because the thing flooded. So they said that we built the most secure seed facility on planet Earth. It'll hold seeds for a million years. It instantly floods from the ice that they didn't expect to melt. And they're running out of the building holding stuff in cardboard boxes out in the snow. So that kind of took away my belief that anybody's gonna hold this in any single spot intelligently because the, the genetic value is too great. And so the diffusion of the material is the only way for you really to have it in the hands of many. And it's gonna be okay if they use it in projects. It'll be okay if they make gains from it. It's okay if people do well from your work and you don't get paid because fundamentally you do get paid by furthering really that part of yourself where what you're doing is you're teaching individuals how to genetically share and move stock through time, which is how we've survived for hundreds of thousands of years as people. And so, so much of that to me is lost because it's my secret little secret. And I'm like, it, the recipe's out there already. So giving it to other people that could use it, might, you might find they have the most valuable people in your life down the road because they're the only ones that actually kept that material. And um, what questions do we have from the crowd for this amazing panel? Yeah, go for it. And then if you speak up loud, I'm going to repeat it so that the people on camera can hear as well. I'm just curious about corn. And um, just basically, like, you know, it's become very controversial because of how much genetic modification has gone on and things you put into it. But from what I found out, the best corn came from when the farmers, like you said, would spread their genetics and uh, they kind of cross pollinate in nature. Do you think that's where we could get varieties that are in basically local areas that grow well? to grow even better varieties and more stable things by having stable varieties in the environment they're supposed to grow in, you know, cross pollinate each other. Anything that's globally traded as a, as, as a crop, uh, they call it a non-orphan crop. And so anything that's commoditized, traded, globally moved, is going through these incredible breeding projects that, that don't work of a GMO. GMO is merging dissimilar organisms. So when a fish and a plant get put together, that's GMO. But if I go into the plant on a genomic level and I look at the chromosome and I start to identify in the allele where the triggers are that make things occur, what I'm really doing is marker-assisted selection. And almost all major crops use that. And what it does is it speeds up breeding practices. The problem that you have with a lot of these is that once they find the magic cultivar to use or the seed line, they run it on a monocrop culture. And so what takes place is you have an extremely high level of risk of pathogenic issues because you have everything the same. And so with cannabis, I think you want to be able to have combined work on pieces, but not everybody shares the exact same genetic material. If there's any kind of pathogenic issues, everybody gets wiped out.
It's like the banana. There was a banana failure in 1960 that wiped out the banana. So they come out with this cultivar, they find the Cavendish banana, and it's resistant, so everybody says, yay, let's use the Cavendish. But why did they keep the Cavendish for the last 45, 50 years? Because it doesn't require refrigeration. So you can ship it. Now we're having Cavendish is issues. And so all of a sudden now there's a race to develop new bananas. But with cannabis, because cannabis is so widely diffused, spread, and held by so many, you used to have an incredible amount of genetic diversity within these pools, and it allowed you never to have to worry about wiping out the entire gene pool. But right now, basically, there's a couple of cultivars that are in, the, in most things, and that's the issue where everybody wants to chase a, a sexy trend. Corn is on a production value, but it's not sustainable ag. It's not intelligent ag. And I think that cannabis can be done correctly by smaller people working on smaller projects and really chasing what they're desiring. And then you can use that material in breeding projects with others, but as long as you maintain the original line so that you don't have too much cross transfer of genetic material. And that's, that's a safer way to do it. It's, that's how it's been done through history. And as a side note, if you're interested in corn, I highly, um, I just went on like a major corn research rabbit hole, which I never thought I would do, but I did, um, because it's very similar to cannabis in terms of history, but look to um, the maize project out of UGA. It's about 10 years old, but they have like so much information about the history of corn um, and corn breeding and all that kind of stuff. And actually through that project, I recently learned that um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture through the Plant Variety Protection Act has about uh, 20,000, or about about 10 years ago, they had about 20,000 um, uh, varieties of corn that were all registered, all distinct varieties. And right now there's about six genetic lines on the market. And when I think about that for cannabis, my heart absolutely breaks because, you know, like not to sound too much like a hippie, but I know I'm in good company. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's like not what the plant wants. Nor the people. I always like to think about, you know, where I got my genetics and those people who had been working with them for thousands of years and a very simple, you know, uh, system that they had worked out. It's basically the best plant from every year was the seeds for next year. And these genetics are still out there. They're not the commercial level. I, I envision in my mind some grandmother in Thailand or, or say, India and, and she's you know, got her garden and she's growing her things and her primary concern is not how much money she's gonna make, she might trade some of it for something. Her primary concern is growing what her grandmother grew. And these people are still out there, I know they are, because I'm here, right? Um, and if you wanna find them, it would be a matter of learning the language, learning the culture, taking the time, going down, gaining the trust, the same way the Brotherhood of Eternal Love did back in the day. But in my opinion, those genetics are still out there. Do you have any advice or strategies for adapting varietals to local climates? That's really about population hunting. Because what you're going to do is, you, in the genetic line, it, some things just don't want to go where you want them. And so then you're going to have to hybridize them to bring in other plants to give you traits that you want to make it work in terms of, that's cultivar application, right? So if we're talking about cultivar application, it means it, does it have survivability, workability in the location you're choosing? And a lot of that requires population where you can find the outlier plants that have a survivability. And so like, like Dan was saying, they choose the best plant every year. That means that last year when it was a heat wave, the one that did the best in the heat wave brings that genetic information with it. And then a couple years back though, you chose it from the one that was, it was a very wet season. And the plant that did well that year was the, was the breeding partner that you chose to bring forward into the future. And each time you do that, you carry forward with it the genetic information that was held in those plants. Once you start to put together that kind of breeding process, what you have is a, a big genetic grab bag of survivability. And now you're going to start to take a look and find where are the clusters, where do you start to see patterns of reoccurrence, and what do you desire from that. And it's just really a matter of marking them and then putting together and working over time. But some things are uh, untenable. You can't get that to happen. It's very hard to get stuff that's gonna finish in the mountains of Columbia in December and have it finish here in Pacific Northwest. But if we go through a big enough population of hybridizing that, maybe we can bring some of the, the, the chemovar qualities that we were seeking from that. And then we can put it with survivability on our cultivars locally. 
And so really it's about populations and that's the hard part because the market doesn't want that much differential in the store. So if you give them, you know, a thousand different seed varietal plants to choose from, a bunch of them you're not going to like, the quality won't be there. Some of them do incredible growth characteristics but have poor quality too. And so you end up having to high, high, you know, homogenize it all into some kind of, you know, oil matrix to sell it. Do you have a, do you have a market for the oil? So if you don't have a market to move it, what do you do with all that flour that's on these tests? And that's why these large companies have an ability because they have an overhead that allows them to cover R&D and the R&D allows them to be able to do these projects, look through these situations. When we're talking about a real breeding line from the way like commercial corn would be, it's about 10 years. So it's three years of, of hunting for markers and then the next seven years are putting together the lines. And so by the time you're into that, you know, the, the seventh through 10th year, you're working a thousand different lines and potentially up to a million different plants to determine which one of the lines was the line the company is going to work with in the future. And so when, when large companies are looking at genetics, they're looking at it as a 10 year development curve. And so it makes it very difficult. But if you have a bunch of farmers in your similar microclimate, so say you're in Eastern Washington, it was hotter and drier, you get together with other farmers there and you work collectively and you start to figure out how you can all do population tests and find outliers that work for these situations. But if you're trying to do it on your own, it's a lifetime deal and that's why basically you have to almost do it as a, as a couple of lines, very simple. But if you're able to work with multiple farmers, then you can all kind of choose what direction to each one of you want to go. And in that process, now you'll find some success individually and then between the, you know, the 20, 40 of you, you'll start to really have cultivars that work for you in your very specific climates that the market wants to accept, that you all agree can be shared amongst your collective. And now you have a, a, a line diversity, a market diversity, and an ability to have um, adjustability in your new emerging markets. Did I answer the question? Uh, let, me, let me qualify uh, what I, the advice I gave by best plant, by what I meant is the one that smokes the best, not the biggest necessarily, it might be. Uh, generally speaking though, no it's not. Um, we're, we're going to be looking at smaller plants, hopefully numbers won't be an issue, you just grow more of them. All right, 30 seconds, anything else, each, anything else you want to tell people that you want them to, to carry with them when they leave here today? Sure. Um, I learned something really neat from a guy named Jerry Whiting, who is somebody I've never met before, but he is also into open source and genetics and stuff. Um, and he let me know that he has successfully um, registered hemp seeds with certain state departments of agriculture. So that um, if that is the kind of route that you're really interested in going, um, I recommend looking to your to the state level Department of Ag. Go by your own your own feelings. How, wh which one heals you the best? Which one makes you feel the best? And, and share that with people, regardless of their social rank. Uh, allow cannabis to really be what it was, which was very highly diffused, highly spread, and genuinely shared. Yeah, thank you guys so much.